Welcome back, folks. Hope you guys had a great week. Glad to have you here with me. Before we get started, uh, I've got a buddy out there who's not doing real well. So uh, I want to uh, kind of give him a shout out and dedicate this uh, one story to him. So Adrian, this one's for you. Um, today, we're going to go into the Gullah Geechee legends of the South. One in particular that I like very much. Uh, we're not talking about boo hags. We're not talking about Haints. No, we're going to go into the Plat Eye. Let me tell you the story. Our story takes place in a small town called Andrews, South Carolina. Just north of the town is a place they call Big Damn Swamp. It's a big damn swamp uh, just off the creek. And back there lived a small family with two boys, Tommy, who was 10, and Johnny, who was eight. Now their dad worked at the mill in Georgetown and the mom stayed home. They had the typical 50s American life. They went to school, they had friends, and they would play together out in the yard every evening. This was one evening, midsummer. It had started to cool down from the day's heat. They had already played in the creek when Tommy and Johnny decided to play a game of hide and go seek. Now, their mother had told them many, many times to always be in the house before dark and never to go out in the woods after the sun went down. So they knew to stay around the house and in the yard to play. Now, Tommy was an excellent hider and had bested Johnny several times, whose attempts at hiding were lackluster at best, ducking down behind the stump of a tree where he was clearly visible, or trying to hide behind his father's tractor, even though his feet were sticking out. So it was Tommy's turn to count, and he knew he'd find Johnny in seconds no matter what. And as Tommy started to count, Johnny had an idea of the perfect hiding place. He turned around and crept and stashed himself underneath the porch steps, not five feet from where Tommy counted. Tommy reached ten, turned and started looking, walking away from Johnny towards the wood line, expecting he'd be hiding amongst the stumps or something out in the yard. But Tommy couldn't find him. He must have searched for 15 minutes before the sun had kind of dipped down below the horizon and night was falling. Their mother came out and called the boys to come in. Tommy hollered back, I'll be there in a minute, Mom. I'm going to find Johnny. Johnny emerged from his hiding space and ran into the house, expecting Tommy would give up in a minute and come in. But as Tommy neared the edge of the woods, he heard his brother's voice. Tommy! Tommy, help! I'm stuck! Tommy shook his head. Out in the woods, not maybe more than 50 yards, was their climbing tree. Johnny always tried to climb higher than Tommy and ended up getting stuck and Tommy had to go rescue him. He figured that's where Johnny had hid. So he made his way to the climbing tree. But when he got there, Johnny wasn't up there. Night had started to fall now, and it was getting darker. And then he heard the voice again. Tommy, Tommy, come help. I'm stuck. <laughs> Tommy gave it some thought. and thought maybe he was over by that bunch of old logs. They were always rotting. Maybe his foot got stuck. So he headed that way, a little bit further into the woods. And when he got there, he found nothing. He didn't know where to look yet, and then he heard the voice again, further into the woods. Tommy started making his way towards it when he heard something rustling around him. He turned and looked, and... Sitting on one of the logs was just a mangy old polecat. Wasn't paying him any mind, and so he thought he'd ignore it. But then 
Tommy heard something he didn't expect. His mother was calling from the porch, realizing he hadn't come in and it was dark. And right following her voice from the direction of the house, he heard Johnny's voice. Tommy, Ali Ali Auction Free, you couldn't find me. But Johnny was out here in the woods with him, wasn't he? He heard a noise again and looked and the polecat was gone. He decided he'd turn and make his way back home. But the cat was in front of him again. It turned its head towards him and Tommy realized it was not a cat. Its face was mangled. It had rows of sharp teeth. And instead of cat-like eyes, there was just one large red eye in the center. It snarled at him. And Tommy took off running through the forest, screaming, Help, Mama, help! Tommy's mother heard his, her boy screaming and yelled at Johnny to go inside and grab her daddy's shotgun. It wasn't enough time. Tommy ran through the woods, and as he could just see the yard just in front of him, Johnny came out with a shotgun and handed it to his mama, and the mama could see Tommy, and then something snatched Tommy just out of the middle of nothing and pulled him into nothingness. There was a scream, and then nothing. Tommy was gone. Her mother ran inside and called the sheriff, called her husband, called the neighbors. Everybody came out. They all went into woods to search for Tommy to try and find what could have taken young Tommy. There was no sign of Tommy. The mother swore she saw him running and saw something grab him. There weren't even signs that he was running through the woods. They searched for days before giving up. Scoured the area, scoured the swamp even, looking for any sign of a critter that could have taken him or maybe a person that might have grabbed him. Anything. There was nothing left. Little Tommy had just vanished. When the boy was gone for about a week, they held a funeral for him. No body was in the casket. They buried his teddy bear in a blanket. His mother was beside herself, swearing that she had seen something, but no one believing her. No one, that is, except for the Gullah lady who lived down the street and kept telling stories about something called a plaid eye. Stories that everybody thought were wrong. Eventually, her depression and sorrow would lead to her death leaving Johnny to be raised alone by his father Johnny grew up turned 18 joined the military before he left he bought his father a dog named Roy so that his father wouldn't be alone in that house where once there was so much happiness now it was just empty And Johnny went off to war, made his way to places like Korea, Vietnam. And when Johnny was back in the States, he was not home. He was actually at the base in Beaufort when he got a phone call almost 20 years later. His father had passed away in the night. So for the first time since he joined the military, Johnny really went home. He packed everything up and got in his truck and drove all the way back to that little house outside of Andrews, South Carolina. He made the arrangements for his father's funeral and made sure everything was taken care of, set up the house, relatives came and visited, and everybody bringing food and well wishes and of course petting Roy who was 
up there in years now. And Johnny just sat lonely. He decided he was going to clean out the house and sell it. It wasn't worth staying. There were too many painful memories for him. So he started boxing things up. And that evening, he went outside and took some of the things that he knew he couldn't sell and he couldn't move and started a bonfire to burn them down along the wood line. He was sitting there watching the fire with Roy and a bottle of Jack about halfway through the bottle when he heard something from the woods. It was faint. Almost almost like crying. He looked over at Roy and Roy looked up at him and he peered into the woods and then he heard it again only a little louder. It was, it was like a crying of a boy. A boy crying. Johnny leapt up and reached for his daddy's rifle. One, same one that his mama had used all those years ago. And he and Roy started making their way into the woods. Following the sound, it got louder and louder. Johnny called out, Hello? Hello? Who's out here? And he could just hear the crying. Further and further, he went into the woods. Hello? Hello? Who's out here? And suddenly the crying kind of paused and he heard, Johnny, is that you? And Johnny's blood went cold. It was the sound of his little brother, Tommy, a sound he hadn't heard for more than 20 years. He started rushing through the woods trying to find the source of the sound. But Roy, for some reason, wouldn't go any further. Johnny came up to their old climbing tree and standing there beneath it with his back turned to him was his little brother, not not aged a day. Sorry, his older brother, but he hadn't aged a day. He was still a child. Tommy, Johnny said. The boy sat there crying. Tommy, turn around and look at me. Is that you? The crying boy, with his hands covering his face, turned and looked at Johnny. And as the hands came down, Johnny saw a deformed face, rows of sharp teeth, and a giant red eye. Come play with me, little brother. Johnny started running. And he could hear it running behind him. Come play with me, little brother. Johnny screamed and ran as fast as he could. Finally, stopping before he got to the edge of the woods, taking a rifle and just shooting every bit that he could down towards the woods. Back then, they didn't have neighbors, but neighbors were closer now. They heard the shots. And the sheriff was called. Johnny was running out of the woods as the sheriff pulled up and he was screaming, it's out there, it's out there, whatever took my brother is out there. Clearly they thought he was drunk. They thought he'd lost it. And put Johnny in a mental hospital. But he swore, he swore to his dying day, it was out there. The thing that took his brother was out there. And nobody believed him. Except for that old Gullah Geechee woman down the road. She looked at him every day and said, Johnny wasn't lying to you. Johnny done met one of them plat eyes. Now, if you ever go to look up other stories of the plat eye, they're all going to run about the same. Plat eye is a vicious creature by what the legend says. It's a Gullah Geechee legend, as I said before, and Gullah Geechee is a culture that developed in the uh, southeast part of South Carolina and the northeast part of Georgia. So from Savannah to maybe Georgetown, Charleston, Beaufort, Hilton Head, 
Um, this culture was kind of a combination of traditions that were formed here and African traditions. And it just became its own little culture and its own little place here in the Low Country. Um, and the legends that spawned from the culture have a very deep, deep history here in the Low Country, where people have been telling these stories and passing them along for generations. Generations of telling people about the Plat Eye or the Boo Hanks or the Hag. Now, the true legend of the Plat Eye, as it's said when you go to look it up, is that it is a spirit that was met and a, met a violent end in the woods. So probably somebody that was killed wrongfully. The spirit comes back and is twisted and warped to a vengeful soul that hunts down anyone who enters the woods, driving them mad and feeding off of their fear and madness. Um, but of course, when you hear the story, the plat eye does a little bit more than drive you mad. In fact, the plat eye eats you alive. But hey, that's what happens when you run into creepy monsters out in the middle of the woods that only have one giant red eye. So if you're ever down in the low country, don't go in the woods at night. And if you do go in the woods at night and you hear something that you shouldn't be hearing, you might want to get away because uh, you never know. You might just run into a plat eye yourself. That's our story for this week. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, don't worry. There are plenty of other legends from the Gullah Geechee culture that I'm going to get into at later dates. But for now, the plat eye seemed like a great place to start. As always, have a great week. Drink your water, as my friend Adrian always says. Uh, if you get a chance, go to Amazon. Look for my books, Through the Flames and Redcoats. And if you can, please subscribe and support. That way I can make a better podcast for you. And me. See you soon.